Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. This morning, we'll continue our reading and discussion of Martin Luther's great work entitled On the Councils and the Church. We'll retreat one paragraph, as is our custom, to, uh, for, to maintain continuity. And I would like to reread the previous paragraph and make some more comment about it. I feel like I rather rushed through it. There's much in it that should be discussed. Martin Luther has been, in this portion of his work, dealing specifically with the purpose and the limits, the natural limits that should be placed upon a church council. The great church councils, as in Jerusalem and Nicaea and Constantinople and on and on, and the issues that they dealt with and the extra issues also that they dealt with, the unnecessary issues that really clouded the main issue. Martin Luther insists that a church council should be convened only in matters where a heresy or a departure from scriptural truth has gained ground and needs to be dealt with. And then the council should be called to deal with that heresy in only but one way, and that is to uphold ancient Christian belief, the scriptural belief. The, art, the council have no power to initiate new articles of faith or to initiate new good works or any such thing, but to simply maintain the scriptural truth. That's the only legitimate purpose for a free Christian council. Now, the Pope would have it otherwise. The Pope would not allow a council to be convened unless he called it. And the council wouldn't be allowed to deal with anything other than the issues brought forward by the Pope. And that, naturally, as is proven copiously in history was simply to reinforce the, pa- the papacy's supreme, godlike power and authority. Never was the true Christian faith actually dealt with. It wasn't upheld. It was there only for the purpose of upholding and strengthening and extending and adding authority to the papacy's fictitious claim of, of uh, uh, the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, as if he were God himself in the flesh. Martin Luther demands that a council be held to uphold the true Christian faith, and that is, there's no justification in the Scriptures for a pope. None whatsoever. And that's why I would call a Christian council today, a free Christian council, to deal with the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. Strip him completely of any and all authority. And to condemn him as a supreme heresy. And then uphold his Christian faith the true Christian faith. Christ and Christ alone is the rock and the foundation of our faith. He is our Lord and our King. He is our lawyer. He is our advocate. He is our redeemer. He is our all in all. And we uphold him and his words alone. And we reject all others. That is the purpose of a true Christian council. This is the kind of council that Martin Luther would have us. But in the meantime, he is setting forth the limitations of a free Christian council. And he has turned down the screws of those limits to the point 
of isolating its purpose to one and one thing only. That's upholding the true Christian faith. Now, I will begin reading the last paragraph he said, that we concluded with yesterday. He says, perhaps you might say here, quote, what do you finally want to make of the councils if you clip them so closely? What, what are you trying to do with these councils if you're going to clip them so closely? Limit their power so extensively? He says, at the, uh, at, uh, this is still quoting, at the rate, uh, at, at uh, excuse me, at that rate, with such great limitations, pastor, indeed a school teacher, to say nothing of parents, would have greater power over his pupils than a council has over the church. Unquote. Now, Martin Luther is literally quoting his, his critics who would accuse him of limiting too closely the limits of a council. And that he would limit the councils to even greater limitations that are on the school teachers and, and the pupils in the schools. And here's what Martin Luther answers his critics. Do you think then that the offices of pastor and school teacher are so low that they cannot be compared with a council? How would one assemble a council if there were no pastors or bishops? Okay. What's, what's Martin Luther Im implying here? That the parents who are instructed of the Lord in the Scriptures to raise up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, the parents who would see to it and who did see to it in Germany that the school teachers were Christians upholding the true Christian faith and also the parents, the, the parents of the children in the schools and the parents of the children in the churches would see to it that the pastor of the church was also a Christian and raised up the children in the true Christian faith. All right, now from this alone, we have a discussion, don't we? Because there are many pastors today, and I'll save the schools for last, there are many pastors today who are not Christian they do not hold up the Christian faith. The whole pastoral pastorate of the Roman Catholic Church does not uphold the Christian faith. They uphold the laws of the church, the power of the Pope, the so-called sacraments, and they preach a, a works gospel whereby there can be no salvation. Okay? They do not preach grace. They preach the Mass, that you must participate in the Mass and the ritual re-killing of Christ so that grace may be earned. Okay, it, The Roman Catholic teaching from top to bottom is a works gospel, not a grace gospel. And likewise, the Protestant churches, the Protestant pastors, are not Protestant. They do not protest this papal aberration. As a matter of fact, they seek peace and unity, unite the entire quote-unquote Christian faith when Roman Catholicism isn't Christianity at all. Oh yes, it's regarded in this nation and the world as Christianity, but not by the scriptures. It cannot be called Christianity. It can only be called the antithesis of Christianity. So what Protestant pastor is there today that truly belongs behind the pulpit of a church when he does not denounce the greatest of all heresies, Roman Catholicism? How can he raise up the children 
in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord when he seeks them to see equally Roman Catholics and Bible-believing Christians. And that Bible-believing Christians ought to unite in any matter with the Roman Catholic Church, with the Roman Catholic religion, with the Roman Catholic faith, or accept the Pope as any authority in the world. Why is it not preached from the pulpits of the churches today that Roman Catholicism is the greatest of all heresies? Okay. Why are not the pastors of the churches today preaching what the pastors of the churches did in the 1500s that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible. Why do they not teach the correct interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 23 through 27? That it was Christ who confirmed the covenant with many for one week. Seven-year period of time. And in the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. Why is not the original Christian faith upheld in a wide discussion about Daniel's prophecy? Why is it not affirmed that he brought in everlasting righteousness? That he made reconciliation for iniquity? That he united us in harmony and acceptance with the, with the God of creation? that he achieved our salvation. See, if you do not preach correctly Daniel chapter 9, verse 23 through 27, then you've literally denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. That's the spirit of Antichrist. And it paves the way for this ecumenical reunion with the Roman Catholic Church because it no longer agrees with the Scripture. The Scripture says that after the restrainer is taken out of the way, the one who now reigneth, that was Caesar at the time it was spoken, he who now letteth or restraineth will restrain until he is taken out of the way, and then that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay? That was the fall of the old Roman Empire. The restraining was the Ro the restraint was the old Roman emperors, the Roman Caesars, those who were now reigning and restraining, the very ones who oversaw the killing of Christ. And when they were taken out of the way, then that man of sin was indeed revealed, the papacy. When the Roman Empire fell, the papacy stood up and the Holy Roman Empire took over from there. That's what all Christians believed prior to about the last 250 years. No one believed in a future Antichrist. The papacy was Antichrist proper. It was the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy and Paul's teaching and John's teaching. There was, no, there was no debate about it. The Christian world knew who the Antichrist was. That's what brought about the Protestant Reformation to start with. Okay? So who should have been teaching all these things? Who should be now teaching all these things? Pastors and the school teachers and the parents. All together. The most powerful and influential teacher are God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian parents who bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And you better know that they will demand that the school teachers uphold that Christian faith or they cease to be teachers. Likewise, the pastor upholds the ancient Christian belief or he too is in the soup line. Now you've got to conclude from what, from what Martin Luther is suggesting here, that in Germany, at the time of this writing, Christian parents 
raised up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They upheld the, the true Christian faith. And likewise, they demanded that the school teachers, to the ever last one of them, brought up the children in the true Christian faith, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They had Bible studies in the schools. This was the kingdom of Christ to them. Christ, their deliverer, had come. They believed that Christ was their king. And Jesus was their king. And kingdom. And they saw to it that anyone who had influence on their children made certain that they were true Bible-believing Christians or they were out of a job. Now, what's the status of the churches today? What's the status of the pastors today? They don't talk about any of this stuff. They talk, oh, they might occasionally talk about a future Antichrist. But mostly, they've missed their calling. They are wolves behind the pulpits, dressed in Protestant clothing. And what about the school teachers? Well, the school teachers are not allowed to preach anything regarding the scriptures. And that's why the United States is in the moral condition that it is. No one's raised up in the true nurture and admonition of the Lord. They can't tell the difference between Christ and Antichrist today. Can they? Well, you, you ask any student today who is the Antichrist, do you suppose one student could even tell you in this country who the Antichrist is? And would he dare say so in the school? Much less the church? They can tell you who Jesus is, but they'll also tell you that his kingdom has not yet come. that reconciliation for iniquity has not been yet consummated. They truly are confused. And it's because we've allowed the schools and the pastors to go the way of Rome. We read years ago here on Inquisition Update a book about the founding of the, of, of the school system in this country. And if I look real close, I may be, even find, be able to find that book. Romanism and the Republic by Lansing was one of them. Dealt specifically, I believe, with the education system in this country. But there was even others that we read that I don't see in my library right now. But we've dealt with this issue, how the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country demanded that the Bibles be taken out of the schools. Why? Because the Bible teaches against Roman Catholicism. Oh, you didn't know that? Well, I'm currently engaged in a, in, a, in, a, in a Sabbath Bible study, and we've learned plainly <coughs> from the Scriptures. We, our responsibility is to raise the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If we belong to the kingdom of Christ, if Christ is our king, the Bible is our constitution, we have a kingdom, we're supposed to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and they darn well ought to know who their savior is, who their king is, who they're loyal to. Where is it ever taught in a Christian community that their king is Christ? Well, they all know about King uh, Trump. How about King Jesus? They're taught in the schools all about the Constitution of the United States. When are they ever taught about the Constitution called the Bible? The schools are cesspools of Antichrist teaching. They focus on arts and sciences. Religion is taboo in the schools. 
Well, unless, of course, you want to talk about Islam. And no, no religious persecution or no religious distinction. The schools are in the purpose of lowering Christ to the same level as all other religions. That's called ecumenism. It originates from the Roman Catholic Church. But the Roman Catholic hierarchy early in the founding of this country demanded that the Bibles not be any longer taught in the church, in the schools. And the people, the parents, agreed with it. And that's why we have this ecumenical monstrosity today. That's why we find ourselves enslaved by other gods, and particularly that little god in Rome. Romanism and the Republic by Lansing was just one of several books we read here years ago on Inquisition Update, how Rome orchestrated the removal of the Bible from the schools. And likewise, of course, if you remove the Bible from the schools, when they come to do their homework at night from the school, they come back home to do their homework at night, the Bible's not cracked then, they're too busy talking about the arts and the sciences and philosophy and nonsense. The children today can't even answer the simple question, which came first, chicken or the egg? Now, what Bible-believing Christian would stumble at that question? When you ask a Christian child today, how old is the earth? Well, you get the same answer you get all over the world. Billions and billions of years old. Where's the Christian faith? can't even answer the simple question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And I'll bet you most of my listeners yet cannot tell you which came first, the chicken or the egg. Did God create eggs or chickens? created chickens, didn't he? Now, of course, if you don't believe the Bible, if you've never read the Bible, you don't believe what it says, you think it's all allegory, you might say, well, I think the egg came first. I mean, isn't that naturally what occurs? The egg comes, then the chicken hatches, then you have a chicken? Well, that's not how the earth was created. Adam was not created an embryo. He was created an adult man. Marriage age because God gave him a wife. That's that's just that's just Bible one oh one. But 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 you can't find children today that can answer the question. Because the parents don't teach them, the pastors don't teach them, and the schools certainly don't teach them. The Bible is just a dust or rag on a shelf someplace. It's not taken seriously. It's not taken literally. It's not taken at all. Oh, there's a lot of people pay lip service to it, but lip service doesn't do anything except chap your lips. Martin Luther is suggesting that the parents, the school teacher, and the pastor have equal responsibility supreme responsibility bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord in a Christian society. And it's only taken 500 years for Rome to destroy the whole thing. We'll be back right after the message.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more, using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border, dot org c-r-o-s-s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org gold and silver is tremendously undervalued global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60 percent annually there is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver the u.s dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency our nation faces challenges on many fronts and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity there has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to contact me directly, I encourage you to do so. My email address is tom at cwaves.us. That's tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. Just like the waves of the sea, tom at cwaves.us. And also check out my website, inquisitionupdate.org, inquisitionupdate.org. Now, we, we understand that it is equal responsibility, primarily of the parents, but to see to it that in all of the upbringing of the children, the children are brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The Lord, not the Pope, not Charles or not, uh, 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 what's his name, the great scientist, billions and billions, I can't say his name right now, the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And if the parents and the school teachers and the pastors raise up the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, then they raise up pastors and bishops, won't they? servants of the church. And those are the ones, the only ones who are qualified to participate in a free Christian council, right? Only those who have been brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. 
the nurture and the admonition of the Scriptures. Only then could you even convene a council if there were bishops of the Lord and pastors of the Lord they are the ones, the only ones, who would participate in these councils. So you've got to ask yourself, who's really qualified nowadays to attend a Christian council? Pastors don't care. Teachers are forbidden to do anything with the Scriptures. And parents are too busy and rely on others to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So who, who gets raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Who's qualified to be a bishop or a pastor in this country? Who's qualified to attend any council of the church to deal with heresy? Or to uphold the true Christian faith? But Martin Luther well makes the point. When asked by his critics... What purpose would the council serve if they were limited to the restrictions, the very strict restrictions that you would place on a council? And Martin Luther simply asked the, the, the question, answers with another question. Do you think then that the, uh, rather, uh, uh, do you think that a council should have more power and authority? and have anything more to do than the parents, the school teachers, and the pastors of our nation? Ask yourself, could the councils have more power and authority than the pastors, the school teachers, and the parents? That's the baseline. They deal with the, the nurture and admonition of the Lord on a daily basis. A council is only convened when it's absolutely necessary to deal with a heresy. And who would attend a council but those who are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord by parents, school teachers, and pastors? Clearly, Martin Luther is making the point that when it comes to being leaders of the church and significant powers in the church, the council is Fourth in order. The first in order is the parents, the teachers, and the pastors. Otherwise, there would be no bishops to attend a council. You couldn't have a council. So what? why is it necessary for the councils to have any more respect, any more power, any more authority than the parents, the school teachers, and the pastors? who raise up the children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord on a day-by-day -day basis, who deal with heresy and false teaching on a day-by-day -day basis. But the Pope was have us believe that the most important thing is his church councils. The church council has literally become the power structure of the papacy, and that it should have all the authority. And in the meantime, they've destroyed the Bible. They've taken it out of the schools. The pastors teach futurism, that the papacy is not the Antichrist, but the papacy is future. The parents don't know any different. So who would be qualified to attend these church councils but those who are ready to swallow, hook, line, and sinker, whatever the Pope says? And that's what they do. Martin Luther makes this absolutely certain. He says, I answer, my critics who would criticize me for limiting the power and the scope of, of the councils, here's my answer to my critics. Do you think then that the offices of the pastor and the school teacher are so low that they cannot be compared with the councils? Let me tell you something. The pastors, the teachers, the, the parents are no comparison to councils. They are supreme over the councils. You can't even have a council without a God-fearing parent, school teacher, and a pastor. You can't even raise up pastors and bishops to attend a council without parents, school teachers, and, and pastors. 
You understand the purpose of a pastor and the purpose of a school teacher and the purpose of a parent? They all have the same job. They all have the same job. The council is just a necessary evil. Do you think then that the offices of pastor and school teacher are so low that they cannot be compared with a council? How could one assemble a council if there were no pastors or bishops? You know what he's asking you the question? How can there be a council if there are no God-fearing pastors, no God-fearing school teachers, and no God-fearing parents? You couldn't raise up enough bishops to have a coffee clutch, let alone a council. He says, how could we get pastors if there are no schools? Schools? Schools are supposed to raise up Christians, pastors, and bishops? Are you kidding me? We can't have religion taught in the schools. Oh, we can have religion taught in the schools, but we can't have the Bible in the schools. That's religious discrimination. That's the establishment of religion, isn't it? You can't raise up a child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord in a public school. What are you, a heretic? See what I'm getting at? You see how they've changed the mindset of this country? You see why it's in the shape it's in today? You see why the councils are the ultimate authority? And only the Pope can call a council. Only the Pope called the Council of Trent. What did he do with that? He anathematized every tenet of the biblical faith in Christ. One hundred of them specifically named and condemned and anathematized. One hundred of them. Just read the Council of Trent sometime if you're looking for something to do. It completely gutted the Bible and Protestant Christianity and made it a heresy worthy of death, excommunication, and eternal damnation. But that's never taught in the schools, is it? That's never taught in the homes, is it? That's never taught in the churches either. The parents, the school teachers, and the pastors in this country ought to spend a great deal of time analyzing everything that was done at the Council of Trent. And you'll see that it was not a free, nor was it a Christian, nor was it a council. It was a lynch mob. They threatened with eternal damnation and excommunication Protestantism and the Bible. It was a declaration of all-out war against the Bible and Christ and Protestantism. Now, if that were taught by the pastors and the school teachers and the parents, how much power do you think Roman Catholics would have in this country? Would they be police officers? Would they be lawyers? Would they be bankers? Would they be our slave masters as they are today? And where would you most have to find a Bible at that point? In the homes, in the schools, and in the churches. And it would not only be just sitting on the, count on the counter uh, collecting dust, it would be red. The pages would be soiled and worn out. People, when they go to the Bible bookstore to buy a Bible, they wouldn't buy just one because they'd be wearing them out fast. They'd buy them two at a time at least. Okay? Can you go to a library in a, in a school today and read a Bible? Is the Bible on the shelf in the schools and the libraries? Do you know where they were in Germany at the time of this writing? They were on the desktop of the schools. They had Bible studies in the schools. I would guess, I would guess there were more Bible studies in the schools in Germany at this time than there are in the churches in this country today. 
They knew their Bibles. They were raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And what do you think they would have said if the Pope convened a council and then lambasted Protestantism and every tenet of it? Which comes directly from the Bible. You understand now why Europe rebelled against the papacy? Why the papacy at the time of the Council of Trent lost nearly all of its power? Why the governments of Europe rebelled against the papacy? and began to rule at not at the behest of the Pope, but at the behest of the people, the parents, the school teachers, and the pastors. Would to God that we had that in this country today. But you would say, well, that's the government establishment of religion. Then take education out of the hands of the government and put it back in the hands where it belongs, the parents and the pastors. Every school teacher would be a Bible-believing Christian, would know his King James Bible by heart, be able to lead devotion, scripture reading, prayer, the whole nine yards. And there might be a little time left in the day for a little arts and science. I mean, after all, we have to learn how to be good farmers and stewards of this natural creation and feed ourselves and clothe those who cannot work and feed and clothe themselves. That's how a true Christian society works. And by the way, we wouldn't need the government to redistribute our wealth to the needy. We would do it out of love, and it would be received as a gift from Christ and not the government. So Martin Luther says to his critics, do you think then that the offices of the pastor and the school teacher are so low that they cannot be compared with a council? <laughs> How could one even assemble a council if there were no pastors and bishops? That's just the same as asking, "How could you assemble if there uh, how could you assemble a council if there were no God-fearing parents, no God-fearing teachers, no God-fearing pastors to raise up pastors and bishops in the first place?" He says, "How could we get pastors if there were no schools?" What did Martin Luther just tell you? Your pastors come from the schools. How could you ever get a pastor out of a school in this country? Something's changed in these 500 years, hasn't it? He says, I'm speaking of those school teachers who instruct children and the youth, not only in the arts, but also train them up in the Christian doctrine. Faithfully impress it upon them. And also speak in the same manner of pastors, who teach God's Word in faithfulness and purity. Well, they're faithful. They come every Sunday. They pass the plate around. They talk about the arts and the sciences and philosophy. Oh, you can bring your Bible along if you want. We might read one or two verses out of it. We'll take it completely out of context. But you can at least go home with a good conscience that you read a little bit of the Bible this Sunday, right? And what about purity? Purity of the Scriptures? I'll tell you where the purity of the Scriptures is lost. There's no consideration for the blood that Christ shed for us. The cost, the expense that He paid in His own blood to cover our sins. Purity? You want to know what purity would be coming from the pulpit of a church today? They would study Daniel chapter 9 and confirm, as all true Bible-believing Christians did, for centuries and centuries before ours, that it was Christ who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, all seven years of it, from the first to the last, in the midst he gave up his own life and caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That alone destroys Roman Catholicism right there. Because Rome, the central, the central table piece, the central piece on the table of the Roman Catholic Church. The very center of the Roman Catholic Church is the sacrifice of the Mass. But they're not taught that it was Christ who brought the sacrifices and oblations to cease. 
it's been so polluted now that scripture means well the antichrist is going to cause the the sacrifices and oblations on a rebuilt jewish temple to be come to a halt to to cease it's absolutely diabolical what they teach in the schools and the churches today rather not the schools no they don't teach anything they don't touch christianity in the schools no, I'm talking about what the parents and the pastors teach. We've looked, we've long since taken care of the schools. They're secular, they're scientific, they're philosophic, they're trash, okay? School is where you go to become worldly, to be indoctrinated into the new world order of the Pope. So it's completely out. We don't even consider the schools anymore. But the pastors teach that the sacrifices and oblations are, are going to cease when the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and off the, let them build a rebuilt temple and begin animal sacrifices again. Look, you got to ask yourself the question, why did God say in the Bible that their sacrifices 2,000 years ago before Christ came, why did he say that they were a stench in his nostrils? Do you think they won't be a stench in his nostrils today? after Christ has already died and redeemed us, and then for a Jew to return to animal sacrifices, do you think God, do you think God is going to consider the, those things a sweet-smelling savor all, of, all over again? What use does God have for a temple built with hands when he said, we are the temple? And what would be a Jew any less than a Catholic who thinks he has to make sacrifice. They equally, together, Roman Catholicism and Judaism, make sacrifice because they've rejected the sacrifice of Christ. So it's all the responsibility of parents, school teachers, and pastors. The responsibility is to raise the children in the nurture and the admonition of the Scriptures and then you get pastors and bishops, those who are qualified to attend a church council. Do you know who you get in the church councils now? People that wouldn't know Genesis from Revelation. They're there to uphold the power and supremacy of the Pope. They are there to uphold Roman Catholic canon law. They are there to impose Roman Catholic canon law all over this world. They are there to denounce Protestants as heretics. Bible-believing Protestants are heretics in the Roman Catholic Church. Or, as Vatican Council II said, ecclesial communities, yeah, we can do with that, but you're still heresies. You're still heretics. Why are they heretics? Because Protestantism, if it even exists in this country, protests the papacy as the literal, biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. He has dominated the Christian world, persecuted the saints of the Most High for nearly 2,000 years. Persecuted the saints to the tune of hundreds and hundreds of millions. And what does the Bible say of us? The righteous perish and none take it to heart. And we don't. Many of us have never read Fox's Book of Martyrs, have absolutely no concept of the multitudes that the papacy has killed, those who read, understood, and properly applied the Bible to their lives and equally condemned the papacy as the Antichrist of the Bible. That's why they died. Rome killed them. The governments of Europe that served the Pope made it their business to kill heretics. The Roman Catholic Church delegated the responsibility of killing heretics to the kings of Europe. They were the ones who carried out the executions. See, the righteous have perished for 2,000 years and no one takes it to heart anymore. Because the parents don't teach the Bible, the school teachers don't preach the Bible, the pastors preach lives, and a castrated gospel, devoid of any blood, 
And so, who goes to the councils? Those who want to kiss the ring of the Pope. That's why we have this tyranny. He said, I'm speaking of those school teachers who instruct the children and the youth, not only in the arts, but also train them in the Christian doctrine and faithfully impress it upon them. I also speak in the same manner of pastors who teach God's Word in faithfulness and purity. For I can easily prove that the poor, insignificant pastor at Hippo, St. Augustine, taught more than all the councils to say nothing of those holy popes in Rome whom I fear to mention. He says, I'll go even further than that. There is more in the children's creed than in all the councils. The Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, which are taught by the pastors, the parents, and the school teachers, also teach more than all the councils. Moreover, they not only teach, but also guard against anything new that opposes the ancient doctrine. Let me read it again. The pastors, the school teachers, and the parents not only teach, but also guard against anything new that opposes the ancient doctrine. Far more than any council has ever done. See where Martin Luther's going? The Pope preaches, Council, Council, Council. Martin Luther's telling you that the world was full of godly parents, school teachers, and pastors. There would be no need for a papal council or any other council. I'm learning to really like Martin Luther. I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.